What does the silver market need for a breakout any time in the foreseeable future? We're here to discuss this with a very prominent figure in the silver industry, David Morgan of the Morgan Report. Welcome back, David. Many silver investors know you quite well in the space. Your Morgan Report is quite well read and quite well known. Welcome back to Kitco. Well, Mr. David Lynn, thanks for having me back. You know, last time we were just talking offline, the last time you and I spoke was way back in February, so earlier this year, and we haven't spoken since. And last time you were on, it was the night of the, uh, the first attempt at the silver squeeze for retail investors. And that video you and I did, it was number 17 on trending. I was just telling you offline, you beat a lot of pop stars and rappers and everybody else that was popular. <laughs> so congratulations. That video did really well. Uh, why don't you give us an update on the silver market regardless? What do you see the price headed for the foreseeable future? And how do you feel about the price range we've been in over the last few months? Well, David, I coined the phrase that silver will scare you out or wear you out. And I think that's a pretty decent uh, take on the market. I mean, it can go sideways for a very long time with very little price movement. People get bored. They give up. They sell out. It's never going to happen. Then you get these huge spikes that can take place. And uh, especially on the up or down side, if you're short and it's up, you're scared. Or if you are short and it moves, excuse me, if you're short and it moves up, you're scared and opposite. <clears throat> it goes the other way and you're betting the other direction. So uh -huh. It uh, can be very boring and it can be very exciting. Right now, we've been kind of in the boring mode. We've been in this range between 26 and 28, roughly, a rather large trading range. Uh, and gold's basically followed suit. Um, so if we go back to uh, March of uh, 2020, where we got you know this huge uh Spike in the gold silver ratio to like 125 and silver printed 12 in the futures markets. We're, we've cut that almost in half. So silver's definitely outperformed gold from that point till now, which is the most recent history. And again, they're going sideways. So what is it going to take? Well, it's going to take more buying pressure. And there has been a great deal of buying pressure. My take right now, David, is that the silver market's price is not really reflective of the fundamentals in the silver market, meaning that there's still very robust demand on the retail side and even on the institutional side, large investors. We are on track to pretty much meet what we saw last year. We're halfway through the year. Last year, 2020, saw the largest investment demand in silver that I've ever witnessed, meaning that industrial demands are roughly 50% of the market, so round numbers, 500 million ounces. We had over 500 million ounces in investment demand last year, 2020. Obviously, somebody had some clear vision toward the silver market. Institutionally, or ETPs, over 300 million. Retail, about 200 million. Again, I repeat, we're on track for about that much silver so far. And the one thing that sort of surprised me, and I'm happy to see, although I'm not happy to pay it, is the larger premiums that we've witnessed for months now. And they are starting to fall back. And I'm happy because no one really wants to pay a large premium, but it does tell us the tightness in the market, at least on the retail side, is yeah. still significant. So there's still people out there buying. Uh, so long term, I'm still bullish. What will it take? More pressure still. There's a huge short position. The market fell off, as you know, the last couple of weeks, rather significantly, roughly round numbers, 28 to 26. A lot of short covering was accomplished, but my view studying the COT for years didn't look like enough. Silver's uh, technically at a make or break point. It could go lower, uh, it could go higher. Uh, if I was yeah. gonna bet, I really wouldn't suggest, I don't really know, but uh, longer term, I'm still very bullish. So you were right, David, uh, on several points. I'd like to follow up first on the premium side. So you're right, premiums have been very high compared to the historic average. Now, the, some retail investors, especially the people buying physical silver, would say that premiums are reflective of the real price. So maybe the spot price hasn't, hasn't moved all that much, but the, the premium plus the spot price is what they're, what they're actually paying. So why do you think the premiums are coming back down? Is it because investment demand is waning, or do you think that the supply is uh, re recovering back to normal, should we say? Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> demand is waning slightly. 
on the retail side, meaning the smaller investor. On the larger investors, it hasn't start, uh, backed off yet. So the main thing, as you know, but maybe it take a minute or two, you know, silver is a derivatives market. It's backed by commercial bars. And that's, you know, a hunk of silver that's roughly 1,000 troy ounces. But when you get in the retail market, you get into a product like a government minted coin, a privately minted medallion, a kilo bar, a hundred ounce bar. And so those are refined products or re-refined products and it costs more because there was energy taken to produce those products. So there is a standard amount of you know, cost involved just to take a thousand ounce bar and turn it into a thousand coins, for example. So that adds, depends, you know, two, three bucks per unit. So that's the normal spread. And then, of course, the dealer has to make a profit on top of that. So there is a reason for a spread always. But again, as you said, David, you know, where is it? And the spread is rather high. But that, is that the new standard? I really don't want to stick my neck out that far and say yes. No problem. But it has persisted longer than last time in 2008 during the financial crisis where we had these huge premiums. That only lasted a couple of months or so. Uh -huh. This time it's gone on basically, as you said, from February to present day. And uh, it's, the, it's the true price. I mean, it's really difficult to say what's the real price of silver. We have the derivatives, commercial bar price, and then we have everything else. So if you take everything else to, into account and average that across the world, you would have, let's say, the world price of silver. And that would be based on like countries like some of the European countries that had a 17% value added tax on top of silver. So I think the best way to actually find the price of silver is to do a brief analysis on what it costs in different parts of the world and you weight that average. So if silver is 20% higher in Europe and that's 5% of the market, you weight it at 5%. If North America is 50% of the market and the price markup is, I don't know, make up a number, 15%, you weight that 50% until you get the total world price. And then you would have a much different price than you have in the spot or the derivatives market. Now, this uh, total or aggregate global average price, uh, the fluctuations in this average, would you say most of that would come from the demand side or the supply side? Which 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 of these supply or demand has, would you say, the strongest pull on the price? It would be the demand side. You know, the supply side's been pretty static for the last several years, around 850 million ounces or so, depending what study you go by. So that's been somewhat of a constant. It's actually been falling off slightly over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, so that's how much is there every year. And of course, there's about 150 million ounces round numbers uh, that's recycled. So we have a billion ounce market every year. And it's the demand that's going to tell you uh, you're going to have a high premium or not, because the edge of the market's the investment demand. The okay. industrial demand's pretty constant. The silverware demand's pretty constant. The jewelry demand's fairly constant. Yes, they both fell off last year. I'm well aware. I read the study twice. But uh, nonetheless, you get the picture. It's the, the biggest part of the equation is how many investors want to buy silver for investment purposes. Okay, let's talk about the derivatives market now. Futures traders, they don't have to pay the premium. Is that right? Correct. Now, the cheapest way to buy silver is on paper. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about uh, trading silver. Suppose you want to actually trade the silver market as a trader. What, what vehicles do you have? Several. There's several ETFs. There's uh, funds that specialize in 2X or 3X up or down. You have uh, funds that, uh, or ETFs rather, that do, you know, juniors uh, or a co combination. I mean, going back in the history, you have the HUI and the uh, XAU for basically the gold stocks. So, and then of course there's individual stocks. So there's lots of ways to gain leverage. The easiest and most used, of course, is the futures markets. And that's where you have the lowest premiums in the paper paradigm. And you pay basically, you know, that paper price. And so you, if you're really just interested in price movement and price only, and you have no, you know, reason to be into the physical silver market, that's obviously the easiest way to go. Of course, you want real leverage. 
you can put options on futures in that market's, you know, transparent, open to anyone that opens a futures account. So you can not only bet on the up and down price, you can bet on the up and down price on a futures contract by buying an option on a futures. So there's lots of ways to gain leverage. In fact, to me, it's kind of diluted the market because there's so many ways to buy silver that really aren't silver, but right. they're equated to silver or they're equated to the price movement of silver. And some unsophisticated investors actually think that they're in the silver market when they're actually right. in a paper market. Right. That, that, was my, that was my next question. Suppose you have, hypothetically, suppose you have the entire uh, silver market rushing into the paper market. Would that drive the price of the metal up at all? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand your question, so I'll answer it, and then you can have to give me feedback. But if you had suppose, someone that said Yeah, that, suppose, let me, let me rephrase my question, okay? Sure. Suppose yeah. everybody were to buy physical silver, 1,000-ounce bar, bars and coins. That would have, obviously, a direct impact on the premium itself. It may have some effect on the spot price as well, right? If I were to buy an ETF or a futures contract, would that have the same impact on the spot price of silver? No. When it, so, when it comes I mean, to investment demand, investment demand, yeah. Yeah. So if you had investment demand where, let's say, everybody that has a long position in the futures market right now, mm -hmm. the cover ratio is around three to one, a little bit higher. So that would mean that everyone that stood for delivery couldn't, be, couldn't receive because there's three times more demand than there is physical on the exchange. So obviously, that would take the price far higher. On the futures only, where there's no physical demand, it can go almost to infinity. And we've seen that many times, not to infinity, but these huge amounts of silver that are sold in the paper markets that drive the price down like recently, almost $2 or so, because of the vast quantity of paper silver that was sold in a very short amount of time. I mean, if you want to move a market up or down, it's buying or selling pressure. It's very, very simple. If you want to move a market in a hurry, you buy, you know, a huge amount and that will spike the market up. I mean, you could even do it with a IBM or something if the volume was big enough. And the silver market isn't that big. But if you sell a great deal on paper, there's only one reason to do that. That's to drive the price down. There's no other reason to do it. Uh, if you're going to hedge, you're going to hedge. You're going to hedge off what you have going out six months or a year, maybe two at the most. I mean, I doubt... Some miners go longer than that. Most don't. Most silver miners don't hedge. It's the bullion yeah. banks that are in there with the uh, paper paradigm. How many, roughly, what percentage of futures, futures contracts for silver are actually delivered by maturity? About 1%. If you okay. talk to the CME and you get to the top, you know, you don't have to be at the top level. And you ask him how much corn, how much wheat, how much uh, soybean oil, yeah. it's almost always across the board about 1%. All the paper trading that takes place. How much of that 1% is just traders forgetting to close out their positions? <laughs> <laughs> a few. Yeah, you laugh. I yeah. actually got caught on that one time oh, yeah? myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to get delivery and I didn't really want it. I had the cash to do it. It yeah. was past first notice day. It was past the last day. And I found out from my own experience, you can actually sell back to the exchange, even though oh. you're committed to take delivery. So that happened. Good thing you didn't buy cattle futures. You would have had a cow delivered to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. So there's some concern amongst investors that there's not enough physical uh, silver to cover all the uh, futures uh, contracts out there. But of course, you're telling me that only 1% of it is actually even delivered. So that, that really isn't a huge concern for you, is it? Not at this point. I mean, I want to be consistent, David. I mean, I've said for years that the physical market will at one point take control Palladium is the best example, an extremely small market. But when Ford Motor Company ordered physical palladium, the market demand was so high relative to the supply that it took the price way, way up. And pretty much now it's a, uh, it's a free market price because the amount of palladium physically needed for catalytic converters is showing, you know, is determining the price. So we're staying around the $25, $2,600 per ounce level. Silver could have the same effect if there was enough buying power. And I think there okay. will be. So I think that we could see, you know, a palladium type of move in silver market at some point. Interesting. Uh, palladium type of move. We're, we're going to come back to that. Now, earlier you said that there, is, there was a sh short position on silver that was recently closed out. Can you, can you elaborate on that? What, what was his short position? 
Well, the short position took place, I've gone from memory a few weeks back, and it was just uh -huh. a huge amount of selling, took the price down about two bucks. And if you look at the commitment of traders, the, uh, the shorts covered their positions, uh, or I would say modestly, they probably didn't get out of much of the shorts as they wanted to. So the commitment of traders still is not that favorable to the longs. So I think there is obviously paper price pressure to the downside. Technically, as I said, silver is kind of that jumping off point. It's either got to make a decision up or down from this point. I don't know which way it's going to go. But the fundamentals continue to get stronger. The premiums show that. There's more and more awareness about silver. And there's more and more awareness about inflation. And what we know from the past doesn't mean the future will go exactly. But from the past, we know the best inflation hedge ever throughout all of recorded monetary history, or at least what we're told, is silver. Uh, so we've got uh, a lot going for the silver market, but we certainly aren't reflecting that in the price currently. The uh, commitment of traders report, is that an indicator of sentiment for you? If you see a large short position from traders, does that indicate to you that people are bearish on the metal? It is a good indicator. Uh, it's not a good timing device. It used to be, but there's other markets. I mean, used to be without the ETFs, you could trade using a commitment of traders pretty accurately. Still, again, you should look at it and it is important. But yeah, it does give you an idea. The main problem, you might call it, or I'll call it a problem, with the commitment of traders isn't the commitment of traders. That's just data. It's fact. The problem with the subset of it is that the banks have unlimited capital and they get a 30% discount because they're commercials. Commercials in all the commodities get a discount. So and I'm not against that. I mean, the idea is if you're a wheat farmer, you shouldn't have to put up as much capital to hedge your wheat position because you're farming it and you got other costs. So we'll give you a break. You can deliver wheat. Uh, you're a commercial. Your wheat contract costs you less than the speculator. Speculator has to pay more. Of course, this isn't true as true in the silver market because very few mines hedge, like I said. So that's the main problem that when you get to the level that the commercials can, can, can continue to sell, the buying pressure runs out. These funds that are the other side of most trades have limited capital, and the banks know that. So if I'm playing poker with you, David, and you have, you know, I'm looking at your chip stack and you're all in, now all I have to do is, you know, raise you table stakes and you're probably going to back down. And now the game starts over. And, uh, you know, we play all over again. So it's very easy to understand, or I think it's easy. So, you, so the trading funds and the commercials are pitted against each other. The trading funds buy, 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 buy. Price goes up, 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 up. But they only have limited capital. So now they're, they're all in. They put all their chips on the table. Now they're in a profit zone for a lot of their trades, but they haven't taken that profit yet. So the only thing left for them to do is to sell to take the profit. You know, it'd be like buying silver at 28 and selling it at 35. There's your profit. The problem is that the banks see that and they sell on top of it, which means you kind of have double selling pressure. So that takes the market way down. And as it's going down, then the stops that the trading funds have in there so they don't take much of a loss start being triggered. So it kind of compounds itself. And this what I'll call gain is played over and over and over again. And the only way to really see that cease is for the physical market to take off like the Palladium market did, where we really have to be careful about how much physical supply there is because that's what's determining the price. Yeah. The commitment of traders report, does it indicate to you who the traders are uh, and who's taking the positions? So for example, this large short position that you mentioned, do we have any idea um, if it's from the industry side, if it's from uh, industries hedging, uh, bullion banks, uh, individual traders? Do we know? Yeah, there's a large four and a large eight, and we have a pretty good idea who they are. I don't think we know their individual positions, but we have a pretty good idea who the lion's share is. So it's the bullion banks. Uh, now, to say that you know RTZ or BHP or one of these large conglomerates that mines a lot of silver but really not interested in silver price. That turns their book over to a bullion bank. Are they in the market? You say indirectly they are. But uh, again, for their bookkeeping, they're very uninterested in the silver price, really, because sure. it's such a small uh, part of their balance sheet because of the iron ore, copper, zinc, lead that they mine. 
silver doesn't play a very big significant role. But it's really the banks that have the control. Yes, we know who they are, and we have a pretty good feel for it, but an exact number the exchange doesn't give us. Okay. Uh, Final question. Let's have some fun here. You mentioned palladium several times. If you were to suppose you were an omnipotent force on the planet, okay? David Morgan, (laughs) the silver god, and you could, (laughs) and you had unlimited resources at your disposal, and you had to orchestrate some sort of movement from all silver investors around the world such that silver would mirror, the price of silver would mirror that of palladium uh, that we've seen last year. What would you do? What would need to happen for you to to make this to to make this run a reality? You'd have to go back to the what I would consider a natural law or the natural order of things. I mean, there you go, David. That's a one ounce wafer of pure silver. If you go okay. back just 120 years, go back to 1900. If you didn't own silver, you didn't have any money. Think about wow, that. Wow. Okay. Okay. If you didn't own, so right now, everyone that runs money, whatever currency they're in, it was silver. So all I would, I'd wave my magic wand. I'd do my rah, rah. I'd say, okay, sure. we, we go back to real money. We go back to silver. There's 7 billion plus people on the planet. There's maybe 2 or 3 billion ounces of silver on the planet above ground in investment grade. Mm-hmm. And that would be div- divided up among, you know, how, among the populace. So that's what would happen. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we went off a silver standard. I, well, and we can I, save that conversation for another time. But I guess immediately, once you wave the magic wand, we'd have a run up in price. But once silver becomes a form of money again, a form of legal tender all over the world, you wouldn't really want price volatility, would you? Suppose we were to, let's, let's suppose you and I were to settle debts valued in silver. Let's say I owe you three ounces of silver for some services rendered, and all of a sudden the price of silver goes up. Well, my debts just skyrocketed, right? That's just Well, you could take that perspective, but you could also take the other side of the coin. You Mm -hmm. could say, you know, just make it a chit or make it a crypto or make it anything you want. It's just a medium of exchange. So the market is very efficient at times. It could be inefficient or we wouldn't invest. But once the dust settled, you would be very used to what the value of silver is versus everything else. So look, uh, if I might just um, get off camera for a second. No you know, problem. when I was like 13, my cousin had a $100 bill. And back then, I think the minimum wage was like a buck sixty an hour. And when I saw that $100 bill and I was like 13, I thought that was the most money I'd ever seen in the world. There's $100 <laughs> of silver right there. That's a thousand dimes right there. Mm-hmm. And so what is that in fiat, David? Well, I had to pay 2500 in fiat to get $100. So that's a 25-fold increase. So number one, that kind of gives you the idea of how much this hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. So what's changed? Well, the paper price has been devalued because of the amount of printing of paper money. I see. So I see. this amount of silver still kind of buys what it did back when I was a teenager, maybe a bit less. But, you know, you could get a gallon of gas when I started driving for about 25 cents a gallon. Me- and a dime is worth about two fifty. So two dimes, about five bucks. So you're actually, you know, keeping up with the current price of petrol by saving in silver. Let me ask you uh, this question, final question, this hypothetical question. Suppose everything were valued in ounces of silver. Do you think we would have uh, more or less or equal levels of inflation? You probably have very little inflation because once the, you know everyone adjusted to it, you'd have a, a constant. You know, you know that so much silver yeah. is worth so much bread and that type of thing. There would be market fluctuations, but nothing like we have now. The right. beauty of a sound financial system is when you start out at you know your age. I know you're not super young, but you're a lot younger than me. You wouldn't have to go to a financial planner. You would know that that thousand dollars that you saved thirty years from now would buy you at least a thousand dollars of good when you were sixty, seventy years old. That's sure. the beauty of a sound financial system. Well, thank you so much, David. That was interesting, and we'll follow up more on that topic next time. It's a uh, Great topic to delve deeper into. And where can people learn more from you? Where can we follow your work? Uh, the easiest is just go to the main website, themorganreport.com, sign up for the free newsletter. I'm also on Twitter at silverguru22. And on the main site, there's a blog free. There's about us free. There's the book tab. 
and also subscribe tab. All right, excellent. Thank you so much today. My pleasure. And thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lin. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at David Lin underscore TV and subscribe to our YouTube channel.